Hello, my loves. Welcome to True Crime and Wine. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I am so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me every upload. I say it all the time, but your love and support truly means so much to me. We have a lot to get into today. A lot, a lot, a lot. So we're gonna get right into it before we do. I have a message for you. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to our friends over at NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. My longtime supporters know that I was a customer of NordVPN long before they started sponsoring me and before they were my very first sponsor. So I'm super thankful for them. If you've been here for a bit, you know I'm a big fan of VPNs ever since every single one of my accounts was taken over and hacked. I feel naked without one now. If you don't know what VPN stands for, it stands for Virtual Private Network, and it does just that. It hides your IP address and then it prevents hackers from accessing any personal information throughout your devices. It's super easy to use. You know me, zero tech knowledge, and I can work this bad boy. All it takes is one click and you're connected, or you can enable auto connect and then just connect automatically. There are over 5,300 servers in 60 countries. If you want better speed, you can find a server that's closer to you. NordVPN is the fastest out there. If you want more content, like binging shows in different countries on different platforms, like Netflix UK or Netflix US if you're in Canada or vice versa, you have over 60 countries to choose from. So that's a lot of content. You can watch across six devices and on every major platform, whether you're using Android, Windows, Mac, Linux, and your Android TV also supports NordVPN, so that's really cool. If you wanna get protected or start binging other shows in different areas, which I love to do, click on the link in my description or go to nordvpn.com slash Sherilyn for their exclusive offer. I also wanted to mention that they have a 30 day money back guarantee so your pockets are also protected. Once again, that link is nordvpn.com slash Sherilyn. And thank you once again, NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. Okay, riddle time. I am something people celebrate or resist. I change people's thoughts and lives. I'm obvious to some people, but to others, I'm a mystery. What am I? All right, we're gonna get into it. I just wanted to mention, cause I know I'll forget at the end of the video, I will not see you tomorrow for a true crime wine video. I will see you for a podcast episode. If you watch the podcast, if you don't, and you didn't know I had a podcast, I do have a podcast. It's called Murder Between Friends, where I chat with other creators, primarily in the true crime niche give you a chance to know them have some fun convo some serious convo some true crime convo all of the above so if that is something you are into make sure to check it out so i will have one of those tomorrow or tomorrow next week but for true crime i am just taking a mental reset next week and i'll see you the week after all right let's get into this i am speechless speechless I don't really even have words to prepare you for what we're about to go through today. I will say there are a lot of people in this case. I'm gonna do my best to make it easy to follow, put as many pictures as I can to that person. I don't think I'll use like a lot of different photos of them. There really isn't too many different ones of them, which will kind of be beneficial because if it's like the same photo on repeat, you know, you can associate. Yeah, There's just lots going on, not just with the victims, but the killers too. Today we are talking about the Kugas store i think i got it right let's ask siri here we go see what kind of mood she's in today hey siri she's picked up and doesn't even talk to me now we've gotten to the point where she doesn't even say mm -hmm. the circle comes and she just doesn't even talk she hates me hey siri how do you pronounce kookestorp okay I found this on the web for how do you pronounce cookie store. Check it out. <laughs> You're useless. I'm just kidding of me. Hey Siri, where is Kugisdorp? One possibility I see is Donut Party on 104 app. Want to try that one? No, no, uh, thank you though. She keeps thinking I'm saying cookie store. So, all right, let's try this. Kruger's Dorp. Kruger's Dorp. Okay, so not cookie store at all. I think that was part of me. I was missing the R for some reason. <laughs> Krugersdorp. Today we are talking about the Krugersdorp cult killings, also known as the appointment murders. There is a lot to unpack during this case. 
A lot of it involves religion, but I want to just preface this with take that very loosely. It's more about somebody's manipulation through thinking that they know about religion and using it to control people to do what they want. What happened here was that Christianity and Satanism were used as a weapon for somebody to control other people. And this case made me realize the dangers of what can happen if people aren't open to learning about other people's beliefs, whether you agree with them or not. Just being open to hearing somebody out might prevent something like this happening again. Because if somebody finds they're being lied to or manipulated, they can be like, whoa, hold up, that's not how that works. The people that were manipulated into becoming murderers seemed like your everyday people. One was a teacher, another a financial advisor. Two were teenagers, one of which was accepted into medical school. So it just goes to show something like this, even though it's gonna seem so unbelievable and wild as we're going through can happen to anybody. It all started in 2012 when a woman named Cecilia Stein joins a religious group called Overcomers Through Christ. She comes to them saying that she's in desperate need of deliverance from Satanism. Cecilia Stein was born December 22nd, 1980 to her father Pete and mother Mara in Harris Smith, South Africa. She had an older half sister and was supposed to have a twin brother, but he passed away before birth. Cecilia is described as loving animals growing up. She had a rabbit named Gizmo and about 10 cats. To her family, she was nicknamed Poppy by her grandfather and the name just stuck. Before she started school, the family settled into an area called Hills Haven. They were dedicated members of their church. Cecilia attended Sunday school every week. Her family said she was a very gifted child. She was athletic, artistic, a little bit of a daredevil. You'd always see her climbing the tallest tree, jumping off the highest buildings. I mean, not buildings, but you know, places. And she was never a kid who had a lot of friends. She liked to play with herself. Often you'd find her out catching bugs. She did play with her sister sometimes, but she liked to just do her own thing. And when she was playing, she wasn't playing with things like Barbies or getting all dolled up. It was always guns, never wore dresses. And even though she was withdrawn and kept to herself, it wasn't because she was intimidated by other people or shy. She just liked to be alone, but she could hold her own. She didn't seek fights or anything like that. But if someone did something to her or rubbed her the wrong way, she had no problem telling them off, holding her own. When she was 14, she actually got expelled from school for getting in a fight with with another student and she threatened them by saying that she was involved in Satanism and she was going to put a curse on them. And this was the start of a very long list of ways she used the misconception of religion to intimidate people. After she was expelled, she was unable to go to school again. I guess the threat affected the child so bad that there was actually a police report written. So this report followed her every time she tried to go to a school. So she ended up marrying very young. I guess this first marriage was to a man that I think she married to make her father happy and didn't work out. And then in 2003, she remarried a gentleman who was a police officer named Andreas Stein. I think I'm pronouncing that correct. It's always tough to do South African cases. I enjoy doing them, but I don't know how to pronounce anything anyways. Two months after their wedding, they had a son. Their marriage is one where I think they just existed. Her husband would play video games. Cecilia would hang out in her room. Her hobbies were collecting knives and Zippos. So that's what she was doing. I guess she had about uh, 470 knives and almost 130 Zippos. And even though they were living in the same house, they never really saw each other or did anything together. I kind of took it that it was almost like they were just roommates coexisting. Like if they were on the match game, I feel like they would fail. Mind you, they did hang out enough that in 2006, when she was 26 year old, they got pregnant again. And while she was pregnant, Cecilia went to seek out the assistance from a Christian spiritual leader named Rhea Grunswald. Rhea was a 52 year old mother of three. At the time, she was also working as a financial advisor, but she really loved doing work in the church. And she became kind of this go-to, I don't know, educator on surviving Satanism. I guess she first got into it when she was invited to a friend's church. And that day they were discussing how to convert 
to Christianity and that was the path that she kind of wanted to teach people. A lot of people came to see her and eventually it took off. One of her friends reached out to her and approached her with an opportunity to start her own church. They wanted to have something just solely focused on this conversion. And so was born her own nonprofit called Overcomers Through Christ. It sounds like this was a hit within the community. I think she was quite mobile. There wasn't just one hub where you would, you know, go to church on Sundays, every Sunday at the same place. She did a lot of workshops and most of them took places in police stations or schools. So when a friend of hers who knew Cecilia called asking if she could help Cecilia out, Rhea personally went to Cecilia's apartment to meet her. Cecilia said that she had fled the satanic church in 2006 and she did need help. But the reason for her call and what made it so urgent was that within the church, she had this friend that was a witch. And she heard through the grapevine that this witch was going to have her own daughters sacrificed. And she wanted Rhea to go with her and go and save these children. Rhea says, you know, we can't just go and take somebody's children just based off of your word. But she offers to use her connections at the police department, but learns that Cecilia isn't about that. She feels like anybody of authority, especially police officers, even though she's married to one, shouldn't be trusted. She told Rhea she had a really hard time trusting people and that her whole family was part of the occult and that since she left them, they were trying to have her killed. And she was really scared. She said they had a lot of power. Her explanation was that her father was a high priest within the satanic church and that her mother who raised her wasn't actually her birth mother. Her father had found a woman named Elise who was allegedly a witch who also had a satanic bloodline and they got together so they could create Cecilia. According to Cecilia, she was abused as a child because since she was born with this bloodline, if you were abused, it would intensify your, your superpowers. She said since she had recently converted to Christianity though, her powers had weakened, but she still had the capability of sometimes converting into a vampire and werewolf and also had teleporting capabilities which made it impossible for people to keep things from her. So that's why she felt like these things she was hearing were actually truths because she could go teleport to confirm. Yeah, we're, we're just getting started. Rhea can't believe what she's hearing from Cecilia, but not in the way of, girl, are you okay? She felt awful for Cecilia and scared for her life and felt like it was her responsibility to help her survive since making this decision to leave these awful people. So she started spending a lot of time with Cecilia and that only intensified after one day she arrives after only being away for a few hours and Cecilia has all of these welts on her back and she says that while Rhea was gone, her father came and punished her because he knew that she was communicating with the enemy. So Rhea felt scared to even leave Cecilia. It started becoming really intense for her though because she had a full-time job on top of everything that she was doing through this Overcomers Through Christ. And she couldn't just bring Cecilia along with her to do things because Cecilia said that her father had put this curse on the parameter of her building and neighborhood and that if she went outside of this boundary, she would just drop dead. So everybody had to come to Cecilia. Since Rhea couldn't be there 24 seven, she reaches out to a good friend of hers named Candace and asks if while she's off doing her thing, they can kind of switch off and Candace can hang out with Cecilia. Cecilia and Candace got along very well quickly. They started bonding over childhood traumas and they became inseparable, which ultimately led to them having a secret relationship. As Rhea's group was building and she was gaining more support, she started enlisting some of those close followers to also come and help with Cecilia. She was this special case that they were working on. 
and she created something called high nights on nights where Cecilia's husband was on duty. So the group would come over and they would all meditate around Cecilia, they'd pray, and then almost every single time around midnight, an attack would come on. Cecilia would just start screaming and jerking her body about. She'd become all distorted and say that it was the demons that were trying to attack her. And this was really scary for everybody because usually when this happened, she'd even cough up blood. So no one wanted to leave her unattended ever. Another reason why she needed around the clock care was because she had countless health issues. She had leukemia, an immune deficiency disorder, chronic bronchitis, epilepsy. And while everybody did their part to try their best to get Cecilia healthy, Candace felt like it was her responsibility since she was falling in love with her or in love with her to get Cecilia all the care that she needed. So she funded all of Cecilia's medical care. She she gave her between 10,000 to 30,000 rand a month, which is about 650 to 2,000 US dollars. But instead of Cecilia getting better, she'd get worse and those amounts raised every month. It got to the point where she was paying about 100,000 rand a month, which was close to 7,000 US dollars. And she did this for three years. With Candace helping Cecilia so much, Rhea started to pour herself into her own thing, which meant she didn't spend as much time with Cecilia as when they first met. And Cecilia wasn't down with that. She would tell Rhea that the witches had spoken to her and although Rhea felt like she was doing good, she was actually doing worse and she was cursing people who went for her help instead of helping. Rhea didn't really know what to think, but she started to believe it because after Cecilia said this, all of her connections and the majority of her support just started falling off, which eventually left her with all of the time in the world to spend with Cecilia and it was convenient because Cecilia Cecilia, on top of everything else, also had DID. She said she had about a thousand altars. Among them were Linda, who was a chef, Zena, who was a little bit of a potty mouth, Akisha was the leader of demons, Anja was the toddler and Cecilia was the core. I was reading Cecilia's explanation of DID in the book, The Krugersdorp Murders by Jana Marks. And had I not already done a case talking about DID, I would have thought, okay, this is definitely a possibility. She explained how they came through childhood trauma, which is usually the case. And she explained that one incident in particular is what she thinks triggered the need for this protection. And it was a time where her father had buried her as a child in a shallow grave and left her there for hours. And all she had was this thin pipe to breathe through. And I was like, oh, wait a minute, we read about that exact same story happening in the Billy Milligan case, which is the one that we covered about DID. That book was written in the 90s and I was like, girl, did you get some of your information about DID from that book and then took some of his traumas and turned them into your own? My understanding was that that book was a big deal at the time. There was definitely talk about it. So it wouldn't be unrealistic that the hype could have made its way to South Africa for her to read it. I don't know. I was just, I did think that it was very bizarre that it was the exact same story and a lot of her alters were similar to what was in the book. When it came to Cecilia's DID, Rhea had even more put on her shoulders. Cecilia told her that Anja had bonded to Rhea as a mother. And so all of the care that Cecilia needed was kind of double time now because it was like she had this toddler to care for. Now, I am not an expert at all in DID. I am really curious to know though, if something like that happens. If you're familiar with DID or you yourself have been diagnosed with DID, I'd love to hear if that's true. If one of your alters is a toddler, if they can bond to somebody who's not their mother and think that they are, if that makes sense. So Rhea's feeling really overwhelmed and in 2007, she meets a teacher at one of her ministry sessions in a high school and her name is Marinda Stein. They formed a really quick friendship and she thought Marinda would be somebody perfect to introduce Cecilia to. She was a mother of two. She had a son named LaRue and a daughter named Marcel. She was a teacher, so she helped guide Cecilia and she was going through a volatile divorce and needed a distraction, so she had extra time on her hands. She introduces Marinda to Cecilia. They hit it off. 
Again, Rhea feels like she's got a little bit more freedom to pour herself into another project. And she creates this manual called Know Your Enemy. Its focus was to educate yourself on the occult and Satanism so you knew how to protect yourself. And while she's writing it, she's using Cecilia as her source of information because Cecilia had been a part of it. The course turned out to be a success and Cecilia wanted to also be a part of it on top of helping her write it. She wanted to do one-on-one -on -one training with people. She'd be the one to cleanse them of the demons and then Rhea would baptize them. Baptize, baptize. The problem is, is that this manual came from Cecilia going on the internet into ill-informed forums and using that to write it. So none of the information was accurate at all. And it's not what these groups or religions practiced, period. I had heard on a podcast, I cannot for the life of me right now remember which it is. I will find it and link it into the description. And they do speak about the case on here. And on the podcast, they had members of the Satanic Church come and talk about these misconceptions that were being taught. She said a lot of what Cecilia said was very contradicting, especially when it came to animal sacrifice or child sacrifice, because within their religion, they hold animals and children to a very high regard. They see them as the closest thing to source energy, which means that that's the purest form of what somebody can be. So they protect them because they want to learn from children and animals. This woman explained that their beliefs were living life to the fullest, enjoying life, loving who you love, being who you want, you know, going to the beat of your own drum. So the idea of sacrificing doesn't make sense when she explains it. The way I understood her explanation was that the devil is a belief in Christianity. And so Cecilia would be taking her idea of, you know, the devil from a completely different religion and then applying it to this religion that she blames for all of her problems as what they worship. But she really doesn't know anything about it or what they believe in or how they practice their religion. Again, I, I'm no expert. I'm just going based off what I listened to somebody who actually practices said. And it sounds like it's, it was very individual focused. To follow a cult makes no sense because Satan means adversary and everyone's thoughts and decisions and beliefs are encouraged to be their own and not just follow someone blindly. Like if something doesn't feel right, doesn't sound right, doesn't smell right, don't do it. I could be completely off, but that was what I gathered from that conversation. So what Cecilia is saying is it just makes no sense at all, but she's convincing and she's powerful with her words and people just eat it up and more people are wanting to learn from this manual. In January, 2010, a couple named Zach and Michaela Valentine find the group. They seem like your everyday successful young couple. Zach was an actuary. He had studied for his BCom at Northwest University. No relation to the Northwest. I I don't believe. While he was in university, he worked really hard. He never had a girlfriend, didn't go out and party, just got good grades. His character is described as very gentle. He was popular. While he was in school, he worked at a bar to gain extra money. And once a week, he always attended his Bible group. Michaela was a travel agent for Flight Center. When she met Zach in 2009, she was studying at a Bible university. And her goal was to become a pastor after a two-year diploma. When they met the group, they were newly engaged and planning on getting married in November. So Rio thought it would be a good idea if she introduced the two to Cecilia so that Cecilia could see whether they were clean, free of curses and demons before entering this marriage. When Zach and Michaela get to the appointment, they realize it's a super small world because Zach had known Cecilia when he was younger. They were both members of the full gospel church. And I think that that's really important to know because her draw to people never made them think about the fact that they had already known each other from church as children. And Cecilia said that she had grown up in the satanic church. 
but no one batted a lash. And because they had known each other prior, they built an even stronger connection really fast. Another woman who was introduced to the group was a 31 year old woman named Natasha Berger. She was invited by one of her girlfriends, Amber, to join. It sounds like Amber was going through a divorce, so Natasha was her comfort. You know, like, I wanna go check this out, but I don't wanna go alone, come with me. And after the first meeting, they both loved it. They became quick friends with Rhea and Cecilia. With everything going so well in the course, Rhea decided it was a good time for her to expand the course the teachings. She wanted to develop another component to the first one, which is kind of like in response to, with the first one being focused on knowing your enemy. Now that you know the enemy, she wanted the second part to be about knowing God, the sequel of Know Your Enemy. So she reached out to a mentor of hers named Reginald or Reg, everybody called him, Ben Dixon. He was a retired pastor, a very close friend of Rhea. So she thought he would be perfect to use as as source material and information for the new manual. So Reg and Rhea, Reg and Rhea, develop this, this second part and they call it Know Your Savior. And during the, the development of it, they didn't reach out to Cecilia. Reg made it very clear that he didn't know anything about the occult or the Church of Satan and he wasn't going to speak on it. So they weren't gonna include it at all. This second part was about what he followed and what he knew. And Cecilia didn't really like that. Cecilia kind of played her non-involvement in it cool. Well, not cool, she, she was really salty about it. But she made it seem like, oh, well, I don't even wanna be involved in your manual. Anytime Rhea brought up the progress that it was making, Marinda and Cecilia would just kind of laugh about it, mock her like, oh, you do, do you? I hope everybody's brain went to bridesmaids there. She was just a really negative Nancy about it. And some of that could have been that in her personal life, things were deteriorating a little bit with her and Candace. We haven't talked about Candace in a little bit, but she was the one who originally came to help Rhea take care of Cecilia. They formed a relationship together. She was helping fund her life. And Candace started seeing things that were throwing up some red flags. One of the main things was these demonic fits that she would have during these prayer sessions. You know, the ones where Cecilia would cough up blood. One day, Candace had seen Cecilia draw blood from her arm and she filled up the cut out like finger parts of a latex glove and put the blood in there and tied it up and had these little balls. So anytime these attacks came on, it looked like Cecilia was popping one of those little blood baggies biting it and that's how she was getting this blood effect. So in May 2010, she just breaks off all contact with Cecilia. She doesn't go the route of exposing her or saying anything, she just ghosts her. Unfortunately for Rhea, she didn't give her the heads up and tell her what she suspected, which worked in Cecilia's favor because when people asked where Candace was, she said that her satanic dad had gotten to her, she had turned evil, and she even accused Candace of inappropriate relations with her alter, Anja, the little girl who looked at Rhea like a mother. With Candace gone, Marinda becomes Cecilia's best friend. They were always together. Cecilia was even like an aunt to her children, LaRue and Marcel. By this point, they were about 16 and 14. And so they also kind of took on that role of staying the night sometimes and keeping an eye on Cecilia. Zach's wife, Michaela, was also a main caregiver. She even arranged with her work to take off every Thursday so that she could be at Cecilia's house taking care of her. And as everybody spent more and more time with Cecilia, they started pulling away more from their churches and congregations and focusing on her. Part of it was to care for her, but part of it was also because she was telling them that the leaders that they believed in and followed were actually evil and secretly a part of the occult. And Rhea was also included in these accusations. She decided that she was gonna take the people that she met from Rhea's group and start her own. And she called it Alexis Perdias. I believe it means chosen by God. We're going to double check. Hey, Siri. Uh-huh. I got an uh-huh. What does Alexis Perdias mean? Okay. I found this on the web for Siri's What does Alexis Prodigious mean? 
Check it out. I, th I think it's the way that I speak. She doesn't understand me. Am I saying it really wrong? Hey, Siri. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> Electus Perdias. Oh, you're gone. Okay. Let's just go to Safari. Why do I even try? Yes. Chosen by God. Thanks, Siri, for making me feel like a bag of crap all the time. As soon as she started it, she had her very loyal members who were Marinda, her children, LaRue, Marcel, Zach, Michaela, and their friend Amber. Marinda was her ride or die though, BFF, very loyal. She even cut her ex-husband off of seeing their children because she believed him to be dark and she wanted her children to focus on being as devoted to C, as she called Cecilia, as she was. Her children weren't even allowed to have friends. They moved into the same apartment building as Cecilia to be closer to her. Allegedly, Cecilia, Marinda, and her children also started using crystal meth, which intensified the belief that they thought they were the only ones who could help Cecilia ward off evil. Every group member had the the name of the, of the group or cult tattooed on them, except Amber. She always felt like she was on the outside because she wasn't related to anybody. She wasn't married to somebody. So it was just kind of her. Eventually she did meet a man named James who was a member of Rhea's group, but Rhea and Natasha didn't really think that he was a good fit for Amber and they expressed that to her. They thought that she could do better. She was into him though. So she brought him over to Cecilia's group and obviously Cecilia was like, oh, we love you here. Like, oh, what jerks. She wasn't really saying out loud that that's how she was feeling about Rhea and Natasha, but she had this way of making fe people feel very accepted over there all while making them feel like she really needed them, which is, it's just wild because she didn't work. She had so much influence and control while being vulnerable to them, I guess. Zach had become a financial broker and all of his checks were going to Cecilia. In fact, everybody had to contribute some portion to the group, but the group was Cecilia. She said a lot of it was going to her medical expenses, but the majority of what they were donating their money to now was going to an orphanage that she knew about where they were saving children from parents who were involved in the Church of Satan and saving them so that they wouldn't be sacrificed. Now, originally she wasn't saying much about Rhea, but as time's going on and she's seeing her become more successful and gain more of a following, her resentment started growing to the point where she started vocalizing to her group members, we gotta do something about her. But she couldn't just say that she was a hater. So initially she spun it that with all that Rhea was doing, she was upsetting the satanic church and it was in turn affecting Cecilia's health because they were taking it out on Cecilia since she had one, once been associated with her. Cecilia told her followers that they also needed to protect themselves because things were getting stronger and she instructed LaRue, who was Marinda's son, to hit the internet and learn how to make a homemade bomb. So he does. And on July 11th, 2012, Marinda, Michaela, LaRue, Zach, and Marcel go to test out these bombs. They went to the house where Rhea's group got together and met and they set off several bombs in the area at at the members' cars. The group is understandably shaken. They call the police, and when the police ask, who do you think is responsible? No one thinks of Cecilia or her group. Even though they had distanced themselves from them a little bit, they still believed all of the things that Cecilia said about the Church of Satan, so that's who they accused. Nothing really became of it. There was nobody arrested or charged. And after the bomb, Cecilia decided that it wasn't enough. She just didn't want to damage somebody's car. She wanted Rhea to hurt like she had hurt Cecilia. She came to the conclusion that the best way to do this was to take out who Rhea depended on the most like Cecilia had with her. And that was Natasha. She was Rhea's right-hand gal. At first she started just to try to drive a wedge between them. She would tell Rhea that Natasha's prayers were very dark and every time 
She prayed for somebody. She was killing the orphans that Cecilia was trying to save. Rhea didn't really know what to believe, but she wanted to stay close to Natasha, even if it was just to help protect her if some evil was after her turning her prayers into like orphan killing. And this just upset Cecilia more. She even tried to say to Rhea, the witch has just told me, you know, the more you stay, the worse this is gonna get, but she did. Now Amber, although part of Cecilia's group, was still friends with Rhea's, including Natasha. So at the same time, while Cecilia is trying to break down Natasha and Rhea's friendship, she's also trying to dig for information from Amber nonchalantly, just find out what her routine is. She wants to know if she has any relationships, if her family lives close, what area she lives in. Amber says she's not really too sure about relationships, but she knows that she's very close with her neighbor. She was a lady in her 60s named Joy Boonsier. Once Cecilia gathers all of the information she needs, she approaches her group and basically tells them that Natasha is this mass child murderer because with each prayer that she puts out there, kids are getting killed at the orphanage. So they need to stop her so the children can be safe. The group without hesitation agrees and they head to Natasha's house to scope out the area, find out if there's any security cameras, security guards, when it's like the most quiet while people are at work or in bed. Once they gather all of their information, they bring it back to Cecilia and she gives them the green light. It's decided that Marinda, her daughter Marcel, Zach, and Michaela will be the ones to go to Natasha's building. The plan was for 14-year-old Marcel to go to Natasha's door, knock on it, and tell her that she thinks her cat is in her backyard and could she come in and look for it. And then while Natasha lets her in, everybody would rush through and kill her. When she knocks on the door though, Natasha doesn't invite her in. She says she doesn't think that the cat is there, but she says just wait there, closes the door, and she said she'd go check. She comes back and says, cat's not there. A few minutes later, Marcel tries again. She's like, I I'm, I'm certain the cat is there. And this time Natasha's a little bit annoyed. She's like, bro, it's not here, okay? You gotta go. So they realize it's not gonna work. They head back to Cecilia's to regroup. And Cecilia knows that Natasha is very close with her neighbors. So her second plan is to use her some way to get to Natasha. On July 26, 2012, Zach and Michaela go back to the building. They have a box that's wrapped like a birthday present and they go straight to Natasha's neighbor, Joy's house. Joy answers and they say that they're friends of Natasha and that they're there. They've surprised her for her birthday and she's not home yet. So they're wondering if they can hide in her suite until Natasha arrives and they're not just waiting on her front step and ruin the surprise. And Joy just thinks they're the sweetest ever that they've come to surprise her. She invites them in and says, absolutely. The second the door closes, Zach pulls out a knife and he tells Joy that she needs to write a note to Natasha, instructing her to come over immediately. They said if she did this, she wouldn't be hurt. So she does what she's told and writes down a note and it says, Natasha, please come over urgently, Auntie J. Michaela leaves to go and stick it on Natasha's door and they go back to Joy's and wait for her. While they're waiting, Michaela's husband, Zach says, Cecilia wants you to be the one to kill first. Michaela looks at Joy who's just trembling and she starts crying. She says she can't do it. While they're kind of going back and forth, Joy tries to flee for her life. She runs away, but Zach catches her and ferociously attacks her with several different weapons. I'm not going to go into detail, but it was absolute overkill. And he leaves her at the entrance of her bedroom. And with her last moments, she tries to reach for her cell phone to warn Natasha not to come over, but she dies before she has a chance. Minutes later, Natasha knocks on Joy's door. Zach opens the door, just pulls Natasha in, and it's just a chaotic struggle and attack. Zach kills her and he and Michaela flee and Michaela cries the entire way. It doesn't take long for Joy and Natasha to be found. Joy's neighbor had heard a scream and by the time she went to go investigate, nobody else was around, but she found Natasha and Joy in Joy's house and Natasha was still actually clenching the note that Joy had written her. When police went to investigate again, the group of Natasha's friends are all so focused on 
the satanic church and then all of these whispers that Natasha had upset them with prayer and that children were already sacrificed. And that whole satanic panic can still rear its head and cloud people's judgment. So again, that was the focus. They didn't know where to look. At one point, they were even looking at Rhea because they thought, okay, you've made these manuals. You know so much about it. Are you just a wolf in sheep's clothing and you're responsible? Which is really unfortunate because Rhea was getting threatening text messages, almost warning her that more people in her life were going to be killed. But she didn't trust the police because they were looking at her so aggressively, so she didn't say anything. And the texts weren't lies. They said that the next victim was going to be somebody very close to her, which was Cecilia had her eyes on the co-creator of the second manual, the one she felt went against her manual, Pastor Reg. She told her followers that Reg was even more powerful than Natasha was, and his prayers were killing even more orphans. There really was not much convincing for the group at all. Basically, Miranda said, what do we have to do? Like they did for Joy and Natasha, they went and scoped out the area. And then on August 9th, 2012, Zach makes a phone call to Reg. He says that he wants to make an appointment for some spiritual counseling, and Reg agrees to meet with him at 3 p.m. the following Monday, which was the 13th of August. Zach had no intention of keeping this appointment. The whole point of it was to make sure that he had that time blocked off and then about an hour before the appointment, they cancel it, hoping that Reg will just be like, okay, well, I don't have to leave and go meet anybody. I'm going to stay home. They cancel the appointment and Zach, Marinda, and Marinda's daughter, Marcel, are already in his neighborhood waiting with an ax and knives. Zach and Marinda had disguised themselves as police officers with uniforms that Cecilia had stolen from husband. And Reg lived in this gated community, so they got a burner phone and called him. They tell him that they're detectives and they're waiting at the gate. They just had a few questions about Natasha and Joy's murders and could they come and speak to him? He says, absolutely. He comes and lets them in as they're walking back to his house. They're having like a little bit of chit chat. They've got Marinda's daughter, Marcel, following behind out of view, keeping an eye out for witnesses. And as they approach Reg's yard, Zach knocks him out with the butt of the ax and he and Marinda attack Reg right in front of her daughter's eyes. The attack was brutal. Again, like what Joy and Natasha went through, just absolute overkill. And they just left him in his yard, left the scene, disposed of their uniforms. And it was his poor wife that found him as she pulled up into the driveway after not being home from shopping. I can't even imagine, just absolutely traumatizing. And same with Marinda's children. LaRue and Marcel, they were just falling apart. They didn't want to be a part of anything, but also felt so helpless. They're they're listening to their mother, their teenagers, and they didn't know what to do. LaRue ended up just using drugs to cope. And Zach's wife, Michaela, was also feeling like she wanted out. She couldn't wrap her head around how her life had gotten to this point and almost feeling like she was in the twilight zone that everybody around her seemed to be unaffected, especially her husband. She was torn though because she deeply loved him. She was just hoping for him to get on the same page as she would and she wanted to be patient and help gently make him see what she was seeing. Cecilia also had her feelings about Michaela. She still didn't like the way she had reacted after Joy and Natasha's murder because she was crying and inconsolable and she thought like that wasn't cool. So she starts planting seeds within the group saying that Michaela's a liability and it just goes to show like if she couldn't participate at any point she could go to authorities and tell them what, what they did. Soon she had everybody in the group especially especially Michaela's own husband agreeing that she had to go. On October 4th, 2012, it was decided that Miranda would be the one to carry out the murder. Zach was going to be at work, so nobody looked at him and suspected him. And Marcel was gonna go with her mother to learn how to do it. That morning, Zach had crushed sleeping pills in Michaela's coffee to make her go to sleep. And as he was leaving for work, he left the door to the house unlocked and Marinda and Marcel 
entered their home. They came with a knife and a hammer. Miranda goes to the bedroom, finds Michaela sleeping, and is able to do what she needs to do with no struggle. All with her daughter looking on. So much to unpack there because not only did this mother take her child, but this poor woman's husband was a huge participant in this. Even more chilling than that was the plan they came up with for Zach to find her. He didn't want to find her by himself and have police question like any timeline. So he made sure that when he arrived home, there was a witness with him. And that was a realtor. He and Michaela had agreed that they were going to list the property and distance themselves from the group. Really, he just wanted to have a realtor meet him on that day so that when he walked in the house someone else was there to corroborate his story. And it works, they walk in, he finds Michaela with the realtor in the bed, the realtor calls the police, and the realtor felt like, okay, I can't judge, but something was weird, but she kept it to herself because you never know how somebody's gonna react in that situation. But one thing that rubbed her the wrong way was as they're just sitting there in silence, he looks at her and says, do you think we'll still be able to list the property? Now this is where the case should have ended. Remember Amber and James who were loyal to Cecilia, but also friends with Rhea and Amber gave Cecilia information about Natasha. Well, James had become really close to Cecilia's group and they felt like they could really trust him, trust him enough that one day they tell him what they had been doing and that now they were planning on killing Rhea's son, Joshua. He's in literal shock. He has no idea what to say or do, but he knows in that instant he has to keep it cool, pretend like he's on board with things or else something's gonna happen to him. But when he leaves Cecilia's, he ends up reaching out to a lieutenant and they're like, okay, in order for this to hold up in court, we need proof. We're gonna strap you up with a mic and we need you to get them to say this again. He does it. He actually gets full confession, gets them to talk about going to kill Joshua, Rhea's son, to hurt her. He turns the tape in and no one's arrested. And not because they didn't believe, I don't think, because Joshua was informed that there was an attempt on his life being formed and he relocated, changed his name, but nobody was arrested and this allowed for seven more people to become victims. They even added another member to their group named John Bernard. Throughout 2014, they stayed under the radar since they were aware that Joshua was onto them and that police were investigating. The kids were still in high school. The adults were working normal jobs. Marinda even got a job as a grade 10 English teacher and she was voted one of the best teachers in the school, most loved by students and staff. But now Cecilia decided that the money everybody was bringing in wasn't enough. They need more money for the orphans. And it was John that suggested they rob his wealthy boss by the name of Peter Meyer. He'd been working at his job at Color Magic Printing for 19 years and he knew Peter well, knew the business well, knew the financial details. Originally, he thought the best plan would be to kidnap one of Peter's three children and hold them for ransom. But Cecilia said, no, it's too risky. So John knew that they were in the process of building a water park amusement park. So the plan became Marinda presenting herself as a lender to get the ball rolling on the project. They reach out to Peter, he's stoked, and they arrange a meeting at Peter's house to go through all of the documents. When they get there, Peter's home, his wife's home, and his son who still lives there is also there with his girlfriend. So they decide this is a good meeting to break the ice, gain more trust. They go over all of these bogus documents, and then they leave. Two days later, on November 27th, they arrange to come back and meet with Peter. This time, it's just Peter and his wife, Joan. Marinda arrives with her co-workers, Zach and Marcel. They sit down, get all settled in, unpack their documents, and immediately, Marinda pulls out a gun and says, we want your money. Peter and his wife are stunned. They are like, we don't have any money here. They tell them to get to the ground and all they want is just the combination to their safe. And they just keep saying over and over, we don't have a safe. Zach thinks Peter will cave and tell them where this safe is if he shows him how 
serious he is by stabbing his wife and all Peter can do is just look in horror and keep saying, I don't have a safe. And then he just starts praying out loud. Marin just starts freaking out because the plan was for them to just rob them. And Zach's in a frenzy, just going back and forth from Joan to Peter. She finally gets him to stop. They grab Peter's wallet and they leave. And all he had in there was 700 Rand. Hey Siri, mm -hmm. how much is 700 Rand in US dollars? 700 South African Rand is 46 US dollars and 59 cents. Terrible. There's no value of money for somebody's life. But when you just hear that number, it just, makes you even more angry. And Cecilia was really angry when they came back and it wasn't what she was expecting, that she sent them to the casino to try and make more money, but luckily they lost all of it. Since that didn't go the way they had planned, Cecilia came up with another plan and it was for Zach to make her the beneficiary of a life insurance policy for about 3 million rand. She knew he was fiercely loyal, so she didn't want to kill him, but she did want to collect on his life insurance policy Policy, so they decided to fake his death and the only way that they would be able to get a payout is if there was a body to confirm that he had died and earlier on in the year they had met a 41 year old named Jared Jackson and he had similar features to Zach. So Zach calls Jared and says that he needs a hand with driving somewhere. He didn't think too much of it. He liked Zach, so he agreed to help. And so Zach goes and picks up Jared and the group had pre-mixed a mango juice with a bunch of sleeping pills to offer Jared. Zach had one that was just regular orange juice so that he wouldn't be suspicious. Jared accepts the drink and guzzles it and it doesn't take long for him to fall asleep. And LaRue, who's hiding in the backseat of the car, pops up and strangles him with no struggle and he dies. They then transfer him into Zach's Mercedes that's being driven by Mirinda behind them. They put Jared in it, they douse it in gasoline, light a match, and then they push it off the edge of a cliff. From there, Zach goes into hiding. By the time the police are called, there's not much left of the vehicle. The only thing left of Jared inside is a ring of his that was an Adidas ring that he always wore. But they don't know that it's something that only Jared wore. They just believe that this is what's left of Zach. Mirinda was the one who was called to the mortuary to identify his body as his sister. And so she says, yes, this is my brother, makes arrangements for cremation and gets on the phone with the insurance company to figure when they're gonna be paid out. And I think they all thought that it was just gonna be easy peasy. What they didn't factor in is that insurance companies, they don't like to pay out. And the assessor that was on the file wasn't liking a lot of things, specifically that this man's wife had just recently died. And right before his death, the beneficiary on his policy was changed. It was made out to Cecilia Stein and there was actually arrears on the account for a while, but right before his death, they were paid so that the policy wouldn't lapse. Since they aren't getting paid as fast as they expected, John suggests another man that he knows that has a lot of money. It's his tax consultant, a man named Glenn McGregor. My understanding is John knew him because John rented a property from Glenn at one point. Marinda's the one who's tasked with forming a business relationship though. She makes an appointment to get some tax advice from him. Glenn sets up an appointment and then John, Marinda, and her children get together a kill kit and head to his office. He invites them in and right away, Miranda pulls out a gun and says, if he cooperates, they'll let him live. They just want his money. He throws her off guard a little bit though, because he starts laughing, thinking it's a joke. And when he realizes she's not joking, he kind of glances over and sizes up LaRue, her son. And he's a bigger man and LaRue isn't. And Miranda sees, okay, he's gonna be able to overpower him real quick here. And she makes a decision right then and there to just start shooting and she screams at her kids to go looking around the house and collect any valuables they see. He's still alive and the kids come back. They said they haven't found anything. So she demands for him to give her his banking information. He does and then he transfers her 6,000 Rand. Hey Siri, hmm? 
How much is 6,000 Rand in US dollars? 6,000 South African Rand is 399 US dollars and 74 cents. So $400. After the money was transferred, LaRue was instructed to strangle him. So with this policy still being investigated, the group having no money because Cecilia takes it all, Zach started living on the streets and ended up moving into this back room of a ministry. He says his name is Michael because he's still in hiding. He wants to make sure this payout comes. And the group, desperate for more money, sets their eye on another target. They decided this time a financial advisor would be a good one because they make good money. They also usually work remotely so they can go to people's houses or have people come to their house. They're not gonna be at an office where there's gonna be a lot of witnesses. And Miranda agrees that it's a good idea and suggests her very own financial advisor, a man named Tony Schofield. She reaches out to Tony and says that she has a referral for him. It's her friend named Ron, who's actually her son, LaRue. My mom's in the business. If you know anybody in the business, you know referrals are very much appreciated. So he sets up an appointment. The meeting was scheduled for Ron's house, which is actually Mirinda's. When he gets there, he's setting up all of his stuff. Miranda just comes out of the kitchen holding a gun. LaRue quickly overpowers him. They tie him up. They take his bank card and they tell him to give them the pin. He gives the pin. They give the card to Marcel and she's instructed to go down the block and make sure that it works. Tony believed if he was honest, they'd let him go. But when Marcel calls and says, yeah, it, it works, it's the right pin, Marinda gives LaRue the signal, a little head nod, and that instructs him to strangle him like he had Glenn. To dispose of his body, they place him in a bin and they carry him down the fire escape. They load him in the trunk of his own car and abandon him in a residential area. Tony's wife is immediately suspicious when it's been about an hour and a half and she hasn't heard from him. She contacted the police and they went looking for his vehicle and found it pretty fast. Around the time that they're finding Tony, LaRue is withdrawing money from his account and he makes out with about 1,600 Rand, which is around 1,000 US dollars. He takes it back to the group and they think they're really on to something with this whole financial advisor route. They quickly set up the same plan. This time they reach out to a man named Kevin McAlpin. LaRue followed the same steps that he had with Tony. He set up an appointment to meet with him on May 26. A lot of weird stuff happens on May 26. And the only reason I noticed the date is because it was my parents' wedding anniversary. So I was like, what's with May 26? Kevin was a newlywed and he had a seven month old pregnant wife at home. And he told his wife, this was gonna be the last appointment that he was going to have. He was going to look for a more steady and stable job since the majority, I think all of financial advisors are commission based. And he just wanted something more consistent and reliable for a young family. So Kevin arrives at the apartment, he's invited in, same thing happens, Miranda comes out holding a gun, they order him to the floor, give them his wallet. He fully cooperated, he gave them everything he wanted and while they were waiting for Marcel to call and make sure that the pin works, he asks if he can have a smoke, a little stressed out. They allowed him and sadly it was his last smoke. As soon as Marcel called and confirmed that the pin was accurate, he was also strangled. Again, they placed him in his vehicle the way they had with Tony and this time they drove him to an area that had a little bit more of a high crime rate because they were hoping the vehicle would get stolen. Just as Tony's wife had, Kevin's wife is very uncomfortable after it's been about an hour and a half, two hours since she heard from him and she immediately calls the police. They also find Kevin and his vehicle shortly after. All they were able to withdraw from Kevin's account was about $100 US dollars. It was about a thousand Rand. So she puts it on the pressure that they need another victim ASAP. As they're coming up with a plan, Miranda's sitting there flipping through the paper and she comes across the real estate section. She says realtors are just as well off as financial advisors and they also work on the same schedule of not having an office that they usually go to, they're just remote. It's only been four days since Kevin's death when they call and make an appointment with 52 year old realtor and mother of three, Hanley Latigan. I feel like I'm saying that wrong. 
maybe L Ladigan and Lay Ladigan. Marinda calls to set up the appointment and says that she wants to list her property. Hanley arrives and as soon as Marinda shuts the door, she pulls out a gun on her. She fully cooperates, gives all of her banking information, her pin, and Marcel and John leave in Marinda's car to go and check it out. This time they're not as cautious as they had been. John parks right in front of a CC. TV camera and instead of leaving once the pin was confirmed and not withdrawing money right then Marcel tries to take out some money it keeps coming back error so she calls her mom back and tells her and Hanley says that's because that account needs funds transferred to a different one that you can withdraw from it sounds like maybe she was trying through like a savings account and then you couldn't with the account wasn't set up to withdraw from there so they allow her to take her cell phone and transfer all the funds into the appropriate account and what she does instead is she transfers them to her husband's account hoping that he's going to get this notification and be like why is she sending me all this money it worked he starts calling her finding out what's going on but she doesn't answer so he keeps calling and they're now panicked because they realize her husband's now wondering what's going on and for whatever reason marcel was all of a sudden able to withdraw some money from the account and her husband gets another notification that now money is being taken out so he keeps trying to call but this time her phone's turned off Marinda instructs her son to do just like he had done to the other victims but he starts crying and saying I don't want to hurt her his mom looks at him with the gun that she's holding and says it's either you or her so he did what he was told and strangled her like he had the others this time they put her body in the back of Marinda's vehicle because Hanley's vehicle had a bunch of Remax decals on it and it was quite recognizable. They drove out to a secluded area and they left her body in some brush. Although they were hoping for a lot of time to pass, she was found the very next day. Unfortunately, she was found by elementary school children who were going to wait for their bus to go to school. That just goes to show how much of an impact just one person's life and death has on so many other people. You know, there's so many victims that suffer from one victim having their life taken. Since the similarities between these last three murders were so close, police had formed a task force because they were confident it was the same person and started moving really quickly. When they pulled some of the footage from the ATM cameras, one of the officers recognized Marinda's son as coming up as a possible suspect in this attempted murder on Rhea's son a couple years prior. LaRue was arrested first while he was fishing with his father who he was trying to form a relationship with and reconnect with and get away from his mother. His sister was also arrested the same day. Their mother was arrested too when they went to arrest Marcel because she was also on camera at an ATM, but she was arrested because there was a marijuana plant in her home. They didn't have any evidence on her against the murder, so they took what they could get. She ended up getting released from that case, and this woman has balls because she turned around and tried to sue the police department for 3 million rand for wrongly arresting her for the plant. Because of this lawsuit that she was starting, she told LaRue to make a full confession and take responsibility for everything. And then she said, once I get this money, I'll get you the best attorney and we're going to get you out of here. So he does. After LaRue's confession, Zach was found and arrested. And then finally on July 29th, 2016, Marinda and Cecilia were also arrested for the fraudulent death against the insurance claim for Zach's death. Pretty sure I didn't say that right. John was the last to be arrested when they were able to pull his phone records and see that his cell phone had been at every scene where the victims had been found. As time passes and the kids are away from their mother, things start to process and they realize She's not getting them out of any situation. She's the one who has got them in this situation that they're in. Once he's able to digest and accept that his mom has manipulated him to do awful things, he officially makes a full confession about everything and everybody involved. John doesn't go to trial. He pleads guilty and is sentenced to 20 years. Marinda pled guilty and received 11 life sentences plus 115 years. 
but she never implicated Cecilia in anything. She said that Cecilia was never around when any of the murders happened, therefore she wasn't responsible. And that's true, she never was around, but she didn't even want Cecilia to be responsible for spearheading everything. Zach, Cecilia, and Marcel all went to trial together. They were all found guilty. Zach was sentenced to eight life sentences plus 93 years. Marcel was sentenced to seven life sentences plus 144 years. And Cecilia was sentenced to 13 life sentences plus 115 years. My understanding though is the sentences are to be served concurrently. So in 25 years, they can apply for parole. Cecilia's old friend, Rhea, who she was very jaded by, ended up needing to change her identity and go into police protection. I mean, I've, I have heard of people being hurt by, uh, you know, somebody when a friendship has run its course and you part ways, but I feel like you couldn't even make up being burnt and being hurt by it and reacting this way and people believe it. Like if this was a, a story and it wasn't true, people would be like, no one would ever do this, but it's true. I just don't know. I don't know much about South African law either. My supporters out there, you guys will have to let me know what you think the likeliness is of Cecilia getting out when she's eligible for parole. Does it work like Canada? In Canada, like we also don't have like life sentence. A life sentence is 25 years and then you're eligible for parole. So my understanding is like, I'm interpreting it the same way that it's similar. Here though, I feel like people like Paul Bernardo would never get out even though he he's eligible for parole and has tried but you have to let me know because somebody like this they don't just change i feel like it would even get worse her level of manipulation and control is unlike anything i think we've ever covered <sighs> i don't know you guys you guys gotta let me know she's she can knock it out all right that is it for me today you guys if you haven't already please don't forget to like and subscribe it means the world to me i love and i appreciate you so much the answer to the riddle, quick reminder, I'm something people celebrate or resist. I change people's thoughts and lives. I am obvious to some people, but to others, I'm a mystery. What am I? And the answer is age, which I'm feeling these days. Gotta make me a little Botox appointment. All right, I'll see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly until then. Make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.